Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dojo Live. This two- no, it's Wednesday already. Wednesday, August tenth, twenty twenty-two. My name is Kim Lantis, and it's my pleasure to be with you today. Helping me co-host is Jorge Hernandez. Hey, Jorge. Oh, you're muted. Hello, there everyone. We go. Yes. So you know, I- it's a pleasure to co-host with you. Thank you. I especially invited Jorge today because today's talk is going to get a little technical, and that's with CTO of Stellate. And welcome, Tim Zuhanek. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's our pleasure. All the way from Berlin, so after 8 p.m. and ready for dinner and in bedtime is we're just getting our day started. <laughs> so a double thanks for that. I'm up for T- it. Tim, today we're going to be talking about the edge revolution, edge computing. But before we do, we would really like to get to know you a bit better. Tell us, please, a bit about your background and what you're passionate about and what's led up to your time today at Stellet. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm Tim, um, CTO of Stellet. And so um, I always wanted to found a startup when I was like 17, 18, started with that and tried weird ideas. Uh, back then that were like had had nothing to do with technology really but just um designing things trading via alibaba and so on and then um 2016 i realized that it's a good idea to um build a b2b business there are a bunch of accelerators out there uh, incubators which only allow or are strongly focused on b2b software and from a business perspective, that just has big advantages. And uh, the passion that I developed over the last 10 years is developer tooling. Um, studied computer science and using the tools myself and never being happy with the quality, I started building tools that I believe were better. Um, and so joined a company called Prisma, which focused on um, GraphQL tooling. And um, later, Prisma transitioned to our database tooling, but I still wanted to like take care like of, of the needs in GraphQL. So I've been using GraphQL uh, since 2016 as well, and I still think there are many uh, unsolved needs. And uh, that's why I founded the company Stellar together with Max uh, Stoiber, who actually had the need for something like that where you cache GraphQL and. When I looked into the different solutions um, two years ago, what you can do about like caching GraphQL responses, I was not happy with the, what, what's out there. Uh, and especially for edge caching, like caching at the edge makes a lot of sense instead of a central data center. So the user who wants to request the data doesn't even need to go all the way uh, back to the, the, the server. And so that's why we focus on edge caching. And since then, we are fo- focusing on that topic, uh, being in this industry for a while now. So I'm happy to talk about this today. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And we're excited to talk about the edge. And like you presented, you know, a bit of the past, where we are now, and of course, the future. But before we do, let's talk a bit more about Stylite. What exactly do you do as a company, the problem that you're helping solve? So Stylite focuses on GraphQL edge caching. So when you want to speed up your GraphQL API. GraphQL is, a, um, for the people who don't know, it's an API protocol. It's a specification that a bunch of people have agreed on. It's uh, originating from Facebook. And the problems they wanted to solve back in the days is how to declaratively fetch data from, from an iOS app, actually. And these days, GraphQL is um, used a lot in Fortune 500 companies and Indie hackers are using that to build new uh, projects. And so GraphQL has a very specific uh, structure of dividing reads and writes. And uh, that is very valuable if you want to cache. And if you want to, and what is caching is basically saving a copy of data somewhere. And so with Stellate, we make this caching easy and uh, give developers tools to cache GraphQL basically. And from there, we are expanding further GraphQL um, uh, offerings. And this week, we're actually launching GraphQL metrics service, for example. So that's why we renamed the company. The company previously has been called GraphCDN. Um, CDN probably rings the bell for most people, rather known for like the static side of things, static caching. You might have Im- images or something at the edge. But I think we will later talk a bit more about that. 
And so we uh, changed the name because we're not just doing uh, edge caching anymore. And we're building a bunch of production GraphQL tooling. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And so let's get to it. The topic that you chose today is the edge revolution just started, and you're here to tell us why, um, well, more about what's possible, right, with the edge, and to take a little bit of the history, where are we currently at, and I guess where you think that, it, that it's headed. So why don't we start there? I think you tapped into the history a bit when you were laying out Stylite, but let's go. What is the history of the edge? Where are we at now? Where do you think it's headed? Yeah, uh, happy to dive into it. So um, I think that the edge is interesting. First of all, I want to establish what the edge even means. Uh, the edge is, um, there are a bunch of different definitions for the edge. Um, it can go all the way from data centers that are next to the user to actually calling devices that are in the house of the user or where the user um, um, is uh, located. And that could even, if you want to go far with the edge term, it's um, a Tesla cars are the edge uh, because like the, the nearest uh, to a user and they have um, like very intense computing units built in there. The edge that um, I'm talking about and that is, I would say most commonly talked about in the industry is the edge where you have a collection of data centers that are located next to the user. And usually, um, so CDNs have the term of points of presence. And the idea really is that you have an inevitable uh, um, factor of latency by the fact that light of the speed of light is the limit. And so even if we have spe full speed of light, it takes about 150 milliseconds to go uh, half uh, like 125 uh, milliseconds to go half around the planet and that's still a, a delay and depending on the application that's too slow and that uh, means the speed of light would not have any interruption nothing uh, and so the idea of the edge is really to say um, the latency is a problem and there are a bunch of applications where latency is not desired and we want to bring compute and data this differentiation is important. We can later dive into that. Um, next to whoever wants data, the user. Who's the user? I might have a website. And most websites these days um, distribute their static assets via a CDN. So um, CDNs like uh, Netlify, Vercel, Cloudflare, Akamai. Um, and it's interesting because these days there's a lot of like different competition out there, but it all started actually uh, 1998. Uh, there was a group of college students um, and they realized that it was like five MIT students and they realized that um, requesting JPEGs, requesting images is really slow. And so they looked at that and decided, how about we put, we take physical hardware machines and we, we put them into the data center of uh, telecom providers. And that's how Akamai was born. Um, and actually, it's, a, um, it's like a ha Hawaiian term. And they, they came up with that. It's an interesting story. And they, they, they were basically the first CDN. And they started with JPEGs um, because they realized that that is usually the ones providing, like, causing most of the uh, traffic, at least back in 98. And since then, that has expanded in all directions, more locations, more kind of data that can be um, sent and by now we're able to transport any data. CDNs have up to thousands of locations, Akamai for example, and um, we're able to get down to latencies that are sometimes sub 10 milliseconds, sometimes even sub 5 milliseconds. Uh, CDNs sometimes even have multiple locations per city. So if you're lucky, your city has a good location and even from your Wi-Fi you will be able to and uh, maybe there are still some translations, routers, and everything in between, you will be able to get very good latencies below 10 milliseconds or something like that. That's very extraordinary. Imagine like 10 milliseconds means you can, that's like uh, 100 times per second, basically. Uh, and so that's where we're at now. There was a lot that happened in between. And uh, in a sense, we just started because as an industry, we're just starting to understand uh, what's possible. 
Yeah, I mean, it's mind-blowing to me still that I'm here in Hermosillo, Sonora. Jorge, where are you here in Mexico? In Mexico I, City. Yes, and you over in Berlin. And we're essentially having a real-time conversation, right, which, which is incredible. And so you're postulating that this is going to get even faster. That is true. And so the thing is that sometimes we can't distribute everything over the edge. Uh, like in this case, no, as we have a conversation that usually goes over uh, uh, usually a central data center, uh, but that central data center still needs to have a very good uh, connectivity, uh, low latency so that we can talk uh, quickly. And so um, just to get people a little bit from this traditional uh, cloud mindset, what does that even mean uh, to, to work with the edge now? Um, I want to demystify that a bit. Uh, the edge is uh, basically a collection of data centers. Uh, but now it's not just a collection of data centers. You kind of need to put something in front so that when the, there's a certain request coming, let's say from Mexico City, and there's a data center in, in, in Mexico City and one in Berlin, you definitely don't want to hit the one in Berlin. You want to hit the one in Mexico City, of course. And so how does that routing work? Um, there's a, a protocol for that called Anycast. It's IP-based, and basically you um, say that I want to get the... Uh, you do a request for, for a certain domain. The DNS server gives you back the, the correct IP depending on where you are located. And uh, this routing, there are a bunch of providers these days. Uh, Route 53 from AWS is one of them many Anycast providers. And that's usually what uh, CDNs use these days. They might have some more advanced routing protocol, but that's the basic idea. Let us say I do a request into a network. The network figures out who is the next like neighbor, basically, in the network who can resolve the request. And that neighbor now does the following. The neighbor looks into their own like catalog, basically, and says, I might have this data. I might have saved like a working copy of this, like a, that's what you call cache. Or I might say, mm, I might have to go all the way over to Berlin, for example, if the central data center is there. And so how the edge started traditionally, and that's now shifting, is that usually it just was used for static caching of data. So what do I mean by that? Um, static data is usually a, a JPEG file, a video, these things, and they're usually or an HTML file. Usually they don't change too much, and I can just cache them for a while. Um, like JPEG files, if it's that specific JPEG file, the file usually uh, should get a new file name if it changed. So you can just cache it, basically. If it's uh, accessible on a specific URL, usually you can just cache it. Now, um, uh, so I guess uh, that, that takes me to my first question. I mean, we all know the joke that there are two hard problems in computer science, cache validation, uh, naming things, and avoid by one errors. And you are you're tackling one of the harder ones, the first one, cache and validation. So how do you folks do that? Because that's real interesting. Because it's one thing when you have like your cache and you're real sure that it's in hardware and it's there and it's not going to fail. But once you go distribute it, and the network can go down and you can have all sorts of issues where things just disappear or with actually one particular route that you might think is good is actually bad because there's something really slow there. So how do you folks handle that? Because that's a real interesting, actually very hard problem. Yes, that's an excellent question. So um, Generally, solving like cache and validation, validation as a general problem is very hard. Um, and that's why we chose to focus on GraphQL. Um, in GraphQL, you have constraints. Uh, GraphQL is a, uh, has a type system, and you know only a specific kind of traffic goes through it, and that helps a lot. So that means both on queries and mutations, uh, mutations are the reads, queries the uh, mutations are the writes, queries the reads. You know exactly what goes through it. So how does it help us with cache and validation now? So let's say someone did a query and wants to see um, what the latest profile of a user looks like. Um, and I know they send that query and I cache it at the edge. So how can I correctly invalidate this query now? If someone does an update mutation now and they say update that specific user with that ID, 
then we now know, wait a minute, we have that query cached already. So we can just invalidate that, invalidate that specific query. And in GraphQL, you have a concept of identifiers. You know like which entities are present in a query, but also in a mutation. And with that, you can now have a matching. You can say, hey, wait a minute, this query contains this user with ID five and this mutation as well. So I should probably invalidate it. So that's the, what we say, automated mutation-based invalidation um, that covers a lot of use cases. There will still be use cases where the underlying data changes while a mutation wasn't responsible for that. If you, for example, have a cron job or a webhook or something external that changed the database that has not come through the GraphQL API, how do you deal with that? In that case, we give people an SDK so they can purge or invalidate the, the queries and that is usually, so again, and there we can leverage the GraphQL type system and we can say um, the user with ID five changed and we will make sure that all queries that contain that specific user will be invalidated. So that's how we basically apply that to GraphQL as it is a type system. This like constraint now allows us to have uh, this usable approaching system. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good solution for, for the problem. <laughs> He's like, yeah. yeah, great. So I'm kind of curious here, like coming back to this, the edge and how you're utilizing, utilizing it at Stellet, what's the, let's say, competitive advantage, right? So you're, you're a B2B business. Your clients, what are they able to achieve and accomplish that their competitors aren't while using your, your tool? That's a good question. So I would say currently there's not really competition because nobody created like this GraphQL uh, caching platform as a service as we did. Um, there are some open source alternatives, but also not really for edge caching. So what you can achieve with us is really you have a managed service. You don't need to care about infrastructure. We are a platform provider. That means we have uptime guarantees. And um, we basically give you confidence that this invalidation is working out. How do we do that? We give you insights, we give you analytics. So we show you, okay, the, the caching here, maybe you should have a look, uh, you're not correctly invalidating. And so that's also a feature uh, that we just actually launched today, which is what we call purging analytics. And it gives you an overview, are your purging calls working properly? You can set up alerts if like, there are anomalies, if things are changing. And so we just give you this full package. It's managed. You don't need to set things up manually. Usually you need to connect a bunch of different systems. You need to make sure that they speak correctly to each other. You just put us in front of your GraphQL API. And for specific GraphQL APIs, we even have um, out-of-the-box solutions. Um, a big shift in uh, WordPress actually is moving towards uh, headless WordPress. And so what people are using is called um, WP GraphQL. So it's basically a plugin for WordPress that exposes a beautiful API um, based on your WordPress uh, installation. And that's a perfect use case for uh, Stellate because you want that to be fast. You want your website to be fast that is rendering this and you want your builds to be fast, that if you're building your CMS um, and or whatever you're using, Next.js, Gatsby. And so that is something people use Stellate quite a lot for. And for that, we have a full integration, uh, WordPress plugin for that. So it's doing the uh, invalidation for you because it knows our protocol, it knows the WordPress GraphQL protocol. And with that, you basically, with a few clicks, get a much faster WordPress API. So that's like, an example where we just out of the box give you a really nice experience and you don't need to worry about it. So you're solving a, a whole ton of problems there. I mean, from like, like keeping track of the status of the network to 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 solving, of course, invalidation and uh, of course offloading all of the all the SRE work that normally would would go into getting something like this. Uh, uh, working, like I, I want to ask: of all the problems you faced, of all the technical problems you faced, company, which one has been the hardest? Oh, that's an interesting question. What has been the hardest? I will need to think about it a second. Um, there have been many hardest problems, probably, or may, 
Let's say a bunch of hard problems. Top three, top three. <laughs> top three. Um, I think currently we are, for example, um, so um, we are using uh, Rust, the programming language Rust, which is still a fairly young language. Yeah, uh, that's, would, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and it's a few years, I would say, behind Go, for example. So um, when I hear stories back from companies who are using Go um, in like 2014, 15, then you had a few like Go experts out there and it was really tough to find them. And I think it's, I feel similar about the Rust ecosystem right now, but it's growing rapidly. And so um, Rust is a, um, the language has a tricky um, learning curve uh, because um, the language, you basically need to know a new layer of um, like complexity, which is men memory management, plus uh, how to deal with a borrow checker in, in, in uh, Rust, which belongs to the type system there. and people struggle with that and um let's say it this way we you know our, our team is rather typescript focused and now it's really about uh, teaching the team how to use rust uh, we are using rust at the edge because that is um i can maybe dive a little bit into the technology there uh, sure, we are yeah, using yeah. um yeah we're using fastly's edge compute platform and that is uh, web assembly based so what they're doing they're taking any code could also be JavaScript, although their JavaScript runtime is still fairly early, but their runtime around Rust is pretty mature. So they take any code, for example, the Rust code, they compile it into an intermediate format called WebAssembly, can also run in the browser, not this specific code, but generally you can run WebAssembly in the browser as well. Um, and this is like an intermediate, intermediate code that can run uh, in the Fastly um, data centers at the edge. And so this is very specific code that we are uh, writing there. That is Rust code um, that now does all of this like graph cal cal calculation, cache and validation calculation, parsing, and making sure things are running correctly. And I would say um, uh, generally we have a few other services that are, are still in TypeScript and we're moving everything over to Rust. And that is just technically uh, that's work. I would say it's all feasible and engineers uh, enjoy it because you can write very fast code in it and it's um, uh, like rewarding once you wrote that code that it runs very fast and much faster uh, in specific cases. In our cases, we have to do a lot with like parsing algorithms, then uh, Rust is worth it for sure. There will be JavaScript nerds out there who will say, what, Rust is not by default faster than JavaScript. But in our cases, uh, there it, it makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah that's that's uh, fantastic technology choice. I mean, in, interesting that you, you went ahead and uh, jumped into the pool like very quickly. Uh, yeah, because uh, Rust is lovely language, but as you say, it's still kind of early stages. Yes. Yeah. And. Interesting. And I think we can go back now um, to you as a CTO. Usually at the end of our shows, we'd like to talk a bit more about the company, company culture. Uh, what's your thought process or how do you, for example, go about choosing such or uh, what's your process for coming up with the stacks and this kind of decision making? Any tips or ideas that you could give for other people in similar roles like yours? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I was the one who actually built the initial system. Uh, so that means I actually sat down and tried out a, a few different uh, solutions. Um, I think there are so many options what kind of CTO you want to be. Um, there's more the kind of architect uh, style CEO, uh, CTO. Actually, there was a good um, blog post from um, Kelvin French Owen um, was in January. I can link it in the, in the comments. And like he talks about uh, the different kinds of CTO, um, like the people leader focusing on like culture, the architect who wants to build the, the, the crazy new um, architecture. Mitchell Hashimoto is one of those or Jeff Dean at, um, at Google the R&D type and so on. I think from my side, I will probably the go The CTO bit... persona. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, because you can't be, uh, let's say, 
um, focusing on all of them, that's clear. And uh, depending on what you want to focus on, you want to hire for the other parts, right? So if you say, I want to rather focus on architect, um, actually, uh, Mitchell Hashimoto said he will not, he's not CTO, he's not CEO. They hired uh, a professional CEO, he and his co founder Amon. And uh, he's now back to an individual contributor, which is also an option. Um, in our case, to answer a bit more your question around how to choose the, the stack and how to make these technical decisions, I think that it first starts with defining what um, constraints are important for you. Um, for example, in our case, we said that um, performance is the absolute number one, and we could have released a slower version. Uh, we might have more features, but we said that it's so important to have this performance, even like going through like learning a new language, new new tool set and so on is worth it for us because we, we know that's the USP. In our specific case with Stellate, we, for example, have e-commerce just to understand how this is actually applied to real world. Uh, we have e-commerce customers and those are, um, let's say there's a buy button or there's a, like an inventory count. And usually those are um, queries going to a backend uh, these days, um, oftentimes GraphQL backends. And um, if that is slow, your conversion goes down. It's quite simple. Um, if it takes 10 seconds or something to calculate, if you still have that inventory, you might lose a user. And let's say you have a, um, a revenue of 100 million a year, and now the conversion goes up by 2-3%, which can easily happen there. Enough studies around that that the traditional CDNs did, so we can like uh, piggyback on that. Then, um, well, the revenue also goes up by 2-3 million, and there's a very simple um, uh, USP. And so that's kind of the, uh, that's the constraint we said we want to, because of that, uh, speed is important. And so with that, I then looked into all the solutions and literally just tried them out because marketing will lie. Uh, don't, uh, there's this beautiful sentence. I mean, you will know it very well. Um, uh, like this idea of um, if you torture numbers long enough, they will confess anything to you. Uh, in, in, like in yeah. data science, right? You you know that one. You and torture the data long enough. And yes. It'll give you whatever you want. Exactly. And I think that uh, it's funny because these uh, CDN vendors, they have their own benchmarks. And every time the one who creates the benchmark is the fastest. Uh, I did my benchmarks. I did my have my conclusions there. And I think, after all, you need to try it out and decide what are the few important metrics for you. Maybe it's about more about flexibility of the platform. Maybe then it's another platform. Maybe it's a bit slower then. It's a, it's a set of trade-offs. In our case, we decided for Fastly because in our um, tests it was is the fastest platform out there. Uh, again, in our tests, you know, it's not it's not an absolute statement. Uh, maybe I'm not testing correctly. Who knows? No, I think that's that's some really great words of wisdom. Thank you, and to you marketers yeah. out there, we apologize. No, <laughs> no, but, but uh, I think that your focus on speed is like uh, as a user of any cash service that like besides invalidation working i want speed like that's the main thing i mean it's yeah when you are building a porsche like that's what you're gonna go for everything else is secondary you gotta hit that speed so, yeah. so it's, it's great it, it's mind-blowing to me i mean you're mentioning like 10 seconds delay and you can lose a sale and i'm like when you think about that, you talk about, you mentioned I think 1998 is one of your years of reference in today's show. And I mean, I remember 10 seconds in 1998 would have been like mind boggling, right? Yeah. And now we're like, mm. and, and so it's just interesting to see how much more speed is going to influence what your users and what people expect and how much faster we're actually going to be able to get utilizing Edge. We've actually come to the final minute of our show today. So with that, Tim, let's take it back to Stellate. Who, who, who do you look for to build your team? What does your team look like? And, and how do you go about creating a great place to work, a great company culture? 
Oh, that's a great question. Do I have one minute for that? Or? Yes. No, no, no. We're going to, at the one minute mark, we're going to go off air. No, no. Take your time. Take your time. Okay, okay. Because that's a, that's a very good question. I think that what we're looking for is people who share our values. And with the values, I mean, everyone has their personal values. That's okay. And then you as a team need to ask yourself as a founder team, but then also as an early team, what are the values that you can agree on? A handful, more than that is not practical, that are helping you to achieve your vision. And you can have like uh, infinite amount of combinations. And I think that's kind of where we all, where we start because we say like we are a distributed team. We are around the planet. We have, I think we're in six or seven countries now. And um, uh, including soon Mexico as well. Nice. And if you have so many different cultures, you need something that connects people. Um, there will be inevitable misunderstandings. There will be uh, stress if there's maybe some uh, something like if there's an incident or whatever. And after all, it all comes like we represent, we show up with our values. And I think that is that is an investment that uh, is first of all. Obviously, don't. I will just say the following. Don't just write them down, but uh, make sure that you revisit them and uh, see where. How can you actually lift them and call it out? If someone in the team lifts the value, call it out and say, "Hey, you just lift the value of collaboration. That's exciting." Or um, whatever your value is, and that is kind of. I see that as a um, garden that needs needs like constant watering. If you ignore them, then they become meaningless and you can just put them on your hiring page or whatever, and that's it. But I think that's really where it starts. And everything flows from there. Um, some founders have asked us, how, what is your policy around parental leave? Well, how do you make decisions around that? Especially uh, remote in an international manner. How do you make one rule that fits them all? It doesn't, it doesn't work, but... It flows from the values. In that case, we say we really care about the people and we say people first. And so then you can come from there and say, okay, well, how, how do I apply this now? And obviously there needs to be a, um, a balance. We don't want to give people like five years of paid uh, vacation. That's not uh, feasible. And that would then rather be bad for the people who are in the company right now, right? Um, but uh, that's where you then come with the trade-offs and ask yourself, what is my value? And I think that is for me, and, and actually in our whole interview process, that is now what we start with. After initial screening, we have the values interview, and we just talk about them and make sure that we are aligned on them. And if not, happens, actually, then we say, mm, that's not a fit, and that's okay. And then, you know, we move on. And I think that is really, when we see trouble, we see maybe we didn't properly align on the values, or we... I didn't check for the values uh, up front. So I think that's the one, if I could say the one thing, then I would uh, focus on that. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's great the idea that... of an actual values interview, I've never, yeah. I think this is the first time that that's come up in over 500 interviews. So congratulations yeah, for that's, that. That's, that's real cool. It's real cool that you guys live your culture and not just your values and not just, as you said, have them printed there. I mean, just a list that every so often people go on. Yeah, well, those are our values, but what we actually mm -hmm. do day to day is something else. And I also want to say values change over time. Um, it's a bit like uh, with uh, like in per uh, parenting, the clothes for a three-year-old <laughs> don't fit, you know, for a seven-year-old yeah. anymore. And Unless it's a dress, yeah. you can turn that into a shirt. Yeah, Maybe. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I love it. I love your idea, too, of calling it out when someone lives lives out the value. And I think it's all equally important in some ways to call it out when they're not living out the value, right? That's like, hey, the hard part. That's, that's the hard yeah. part. Yes. yes. And, and interesting, too. If you don't too. do it. So, it, go ahead. If you don't do it. If you don't do it, I mean, uh, you are, in a sense, completely invalidating the value. Right. Because if someone very clearly violates the value in that moment, of let's say collaboration mm -hmm. and someone very clearly is not doing that in that moment. Everyone sees it and nothing is being done about it. You are letting the value being invalidated. 
Yeah. That's the tough part. Talking about yeah. it, hey, values are cool. That's the easy part. If but if someone doesn't follow them, that's then cool. I guess I need to totally talk uncool. about it. Yeah. Yeah, cool. but, uh, I think, as you said, you know, you, you pick like what's the hardest technical uh, problem you, uh, you, you've had, and you, you pick the person problem. It's like, oh, actually getting people up to speed with the rest. And I think that's something that, that as engineers, we sometimes forget that the hardest problems we actually have in engineering are not going to be people problems. Uh, that's where we put it to work. And that's where, I guess, a, a lot of senior engineers uh, struggle into doing that jump up. Like, oh, okay, so it's not just code, it's not just machines, it's just not network, it's actually people because <laughs> we're solving problems that people have for making, and in your case of tooling, thank you for working on tooling, because uh, uh, we need so much work on tooling. Uh, and tooling is a people problem. It's like basically making other people's lives easier, but solving their problem. And it, it all comes down to the human beings and solving their problems in, in engineering. So the technical stuff is fun, but uh, yeah, the people are hard. Which is also, by the way, the case for GraphQL. I don't know how much time do we have left before I go down that road. It, it's okay. I mean, here okay. we are. We, we keep, well, the, the last comment, so let's make it, let's make it a okay. good one too. Good. <laughs> That will be a fantastic one. Um, GraphQL is a way for the backend team and the frontend team to communicate. And so you basically, as a frontend developer, you say, I need this. And then you talk to the backend team and they say, yeah, okay, we can make this happen. So it's a conversation. And now people say there's so much friction suddenly. And that's suddenly because the teams are finally talking with each other. So GraphQL is rather um, enabling an organization, that's why it's so popular amongst enterprises, to talk. It's a collaboration tool because it's a platform where you agree, that's our contract, that's our interface. I commit to this, I provide you this, and the consumer says, okay, great, I can build something with it now. And, uh, but after all, again, it again, I agree with Jorge, uh, comes back to the people. Uh, it's all about the people. Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap up our show today. A half hour goes by extremely fast. Thank you so much for your time, Tim. It was great to learn from you to learn more about Stellate and what you are accomplishing. We'd love to have you back. I think we could, there's a lot more to talk about. And, and Jorge, I think you're all about that. If you would have yeah. us, uh, we, we'll get that arranged. So yeah, it'd be great. Um, yeah, we're going to go off air here in just a second. Please stick around, Tim, for one moment. Uh, this is our final show of the week, folks, because tomorrow is our monthly all hands. But do join us on Monday as we recap this week's show and introduce the shows next week, 12 o'clock Pacific, right here on Dojo Live. Thank you, everyone.